Hello, this is John Evans, and welcome back to another episode of Book and Spade. There was a church in San Damiano in the 13th century that had become utterly ruined. It was a pale shadow of its former glory. And into this broken church walked a warrior, at least a man who wanted to be a warrior. His name was John Giovanni, and his father's name was Pietro, Peter. Their surname was Bernardoni. But his father, who was a wealthy merchant, who had traveled often to France, although at that time France was like Italy, not a nation at all, but consisting of warring city-states. Instead, called his beloved Giovanni Francesco, or Francis, the little Frenchman, because of Francesco's fondness for the songs of the troubadours, the songs of the knights. Young Francesco believed fervently in the songs of Arthur, and of Merlin, and of Lancelot, songs of courtly love, where the knight would surrender all of his earthly goods for the love of a great lady, willing to risk all for the love of that lady, willing to lay down his life for that lady. What is remarkable is that this young Francesco, after having been shortly imprisoned and quite sick on one of these warring expeditions between Assisi and Perugia, found himself on the road towards battle yet again, armored to the teeth to shed the blood of men. When a voice from heaven, according to, I believe, Bonaventure, compelled Francesco to return. The question was, to paraphrase as follows, Francesco, which king would you rather serve, the greater or the lesser? And of course, Francesco chose the greater king, and yet did not know him personally, intimately. As a young man, he had spent his time on the streets of Assisi as a kind of reveler, offering good food and good drink to his friends, partying, enjoying good companionship, great conversation, and living life to the fullest in opulent displays of pleasure and riches. And whenever he saw a leper, he would flee or some poor person, he would flee in disgust. And yet, this pivoting moment in the chapel in San Damiano would occur that would transform Francesco forever. For it was before the high altar, before this image of Jesus crucified, that this warrior met the greater king who he was meant to serve. Christ from the cross spoke to Francis, saying, Francesco, Francesco, rebuild my church, since you can see that it is in disrepair or in ruins. Now, Francesco took this literally. He began to take some of his father, Pietro's work that was on sale, began to collect as much money as he could, giving it fervently to those who would be able to fetch a high price, and spent the cash on trying to rebuild that chapel in San Damiano. Naturally, his father, 
being furious, lost patience with his son. And after his son spent some time in a nearby cave meditating and acting as a kind of Western ascetic after the pattern of Antony of the desert and Western figures like Martin of Tours, Pietro would take his son and chain him in his own house while away. Unsurprisingly, his mother released him. And Francis escaped into the arms of the local church. But upon Pedro's return, he would summon Francis to court. And it was at that event, publicly, that Francesco would tear off all of his remaining raiment, all of his robes of opulence, all that he had on his skin, saying, from now on, I will no longer be called the son of Pietro Bernardoni, but shall be content to say, Our Father who art in heaven. And Francis began at that moment not only to rebuild the literal local church using his earthly father's money, but he also began to rebuild the community of believers. He began to work on that church in in solitude and service, and yet more people were drawn and attracted to his way of life, including many of his young fellow comrades, many of his fun, fun young revelers who had spent their life in pleasure and in power and in dreams of glory. Many of these were the sons of also wealthy merchants or sons of well-to-do families. And suddenly you had those who had been used to living lives of comfortability, lives where they would have been used to being waited on and potentially served, now begging from door to door, simply to have enough to eat. Now, Francis, at this time, found himself in quite the predicament because there were many orders in Europe previously that had not sought approval from Rome, that sought simply to live out the call of Jesus to follow him and give up everything else. And those orders often came into trouble with the church hierarchy. Francis then would travel to Rome. And Francesco had been on pilgrimage there before. He had actually poured out whatever money he had in his pockets before the tomb of St. Peter on a previous occasion, exchanged garments with that of a beggar, and proceeded to beg his way back to Assisi as a younger man. But now he was going accompanied by followers. Now, at that time, the Pope was Innocent III. Innocent was a holy father who was vexed with troubles with the Crusades in the East, friction with the Eastern Orthodox communities out eastward, friction within his own Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church with hierarchs contending with one another, and with great trouble in what would be modern-day southern France with the Cathar or Albigensian heresy, there were many decrying corruption in the church and taking steps to break from the church in horrific ways, in violent ways. And southern France was becoming a bloodbath. Innocent III was faced with a great crisis on every single front. And so when this poor, smelly beggar came from Assisi, tradition records that he told him to go sleep with the pigs and thrust Francis out. Francis did not break from Rome. Francesco did not break from the papacy. He went in obedience to the nearest pig pen and his companions and slept with the pigs. With help from a local bishop, 
a good friend of his, I believe from Assisi or that area in Umbria. Francesco returned to the papal palace. One could imagine the looks of the archbishops and cardinals upon finding the smelly beggar again, all of his companions, thinking that at any moment Innocent III would thrust him out. But Pope Innocent III did not do it this time. Instead, he declared that he had a dream. And in that dream, he saw Francis, Francesco, lifting up the walls of the church, keeping them from crashing to the ground, and gave him permission to live out the austere order that he wished to bring into existence. Not to a lady love like Guinevere, not to a lady love like that of Iselt or of the great romantic ballads, but instead a commitment to lady poverty. And by poverty, Francesco obviously did mean literal poverty. But more than this, scripturally, what Francesco was getting at was not so much an absence of physical wealth. After all, Francesco did rely on donations as well. But instead, found himself pointing to the reality that we have an excessive need at times, an excessive hunger at times to not only possess stuff, but to have the stuff we own possess us. To find ourselves in a position where the goods that we have been given, the good gifts, begin to become a stumbling block between us and God. Now, it is often said that Francesco was himself the father of ecumenism or interfaith dialogue, this is largely misunderstood in modern times. Francesco did end up traveling eastward to meet with the Sultan to try to convert him on what would be now considered a suicide mission. It is true that he did sit down with one of the leading figures of Islam, However, the historical sources present what was, without question, not a we all believe the same thing and we're all going to heaven in the same kind of basket approach. Instead, the reason why Francesco left was primarily because he believed that he had failed in his mission to create an order entirely committed to lady poverty. He believed that he had failed in fully living out the rebuilding of the church to radically live in commitment to Jesus. And because of this, he travels east potentially to die a martyr's death, seeking if this is the will of Christ, and to publicly declare the good news of Jesus to the head of Islam at that time in the Eastern world was itself an eye-opening, dramatic gesture, to say the least, and one which presumably would have ended in death. The story goes that on his way, Francis saw lambs and said to his brother, See, we are sheep led to the slaughter. We are as lambs before wolves. And upon being brought into the presence of the sultan, Francis expected to be treated discourteously or to be thrust into a position where they might be potentially beheaded on the spot. But instead, the sultan, greeting Francis, hears this friar speak and is overwhelmed by the authenticity and power in anointing that this man has in the Holy Spirit. Francis does not speak on his own authority. It is the authority of Christ in him. And those who 
would hear him would note that he, he didn't speak um, as the learned scholastics that would come, for example, later, or as a kind of fancy rhetorician. He would speak moved from the heart by the Holy Spirit and by the holy words of Scripture in a way that was shocking, revelatory. Shake the foundations of the earth. And the Sultan's response was to ask Francis to stay. And Francis said no. And Francis offered a counter bargain to the Sultan. How about you build a great fire? You pick your holy man, and you have me. Whichever one walks through the fire and is not touched, his God is the Lord, and you must serve him. And the sultan responds, uh, no. So Francesco's response is, okay, build a fire and have me walk through it. And if I walk through it and I am unscathed, you must serve Jesus Christ as Lord and God. And the sultan's response is, no. And the sultan asks Francis, hey, will you receive... Uh, these gifts, these these treasures, I know who and what you are. Uh, you can give them to the poor. And Francis' response is no. And from that point, Francesco did not stay around. He didn't remain there simply for uh, the the notoriety, for the publicity, for the comfort. Instead, he got up and he left. But a great concession was made by the Islamic world. The sultan accepted Francis's plea for free passage for pilgrims <coughs> to the holy sites in Jerusalem, in Nazareth, in Bethlehem, etc. So that to this day, whenever you see these holy sites, it will be uh, Franciscans who are guarding them and protecting them. And what is remarkable about this is this ability for the Franciscans as a result to, through their faithful witness to the gospel, through their faithful witness to being disciples of Jesus, for them to be able to even acquire the respect or reverence of those in an otherwise hostile environment, to hear the gospel, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he rose bodily the third day, that he is both Lord and God. And as a result, what we find miraculous about St. Francis is this ability for him to walk into seemingly impossible environments and for hearts that were as cold as stone to react like the sultans, but at least with respect. Dialogue, in and of its essence, is good. But only when it respects and reverences the very real and authentic differences in point of view. It doesn't dissolve into the kind of murky realm of indifferentism or worse, universalism, claiming that all roads lead to the same place. The reality rests that every single system of belief has its truth claim. And that truth claim, at some point, leads to a portrait of reality. Francis's portrait of reality was one in which God did actually become man, actually did die on a literal cross, and actually did rise the third day, so that the body of his believers might be ministers of life in creation. And so Francis's love of the environment, for example, of the woods, the forest, the leaves, the flowers, Francis's love of dialogue in that instance, which we've just explored with the Sultan, Francis's love of poetry, music, and singing, all stem from a 
primal and foremost commitment to the Creator, Jesus Christ. I believe that one of the great challenges of the present-day Franciscan world and just the world of the faith, even from the papacy downwards now, is not necessarily a rejection of a need to sit down and appreciate the good gifts of creation. We ought to be good stewards. Uh, I, I do believe that there needs to be more conversation with those outside the walls of the visible church. This must be essential, and you've seen it on this channel. However, it is equally, first and foremost, our responsibility as Catholics to present the gospel and to present Christ as first and foremost because without having Jesus at the center of our focus there, it's easy to turn the church into a global soup kitchen rather than the very hands and feet of the offer of salvation. And what is salvation if not the gift of the kingdom? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. This idea that the Edenizing of all of creation has come near. That death and what causes death, sin, has been atoned for by the blood of the divine word on the cross. And that reality, which is central to our desire to take care of the poor, and essential to our desire to take care of the marginalized and to, to, and to take care of the oppressed. That centrality in Christ is often lost because it is uncomfortable to those who would want to reduce Christianity to a philosophy or to a system of beliefs or to a kind of New Age hippieism rather than a living personal relationship with the Messiah. And that relationship should lead to those good things. But we are first and foremost, like Francis, in those instances, called to radically reform the house from within a living, breathing, personal commitment to Christ. Sultans will come and go. Kings will come and go. Movements, even orders within the church, But what will last is he who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, the author of all things the Alpha and the Omega, with whom we have to deal. And we have a rendezvous with him at the end of our lives. Francesco left an amazing legacy because he accomplished three things which had utterly been submerged in the 13th century. The faith had become rationalistic or philosophical or overly urbane and locked in monastery doors. Francis brought scripture and a relationship with Jesus into the public square. He got his friars into a position where they could go and preach to those on the ground. This meant involvement with the laity, with ordinary men and women, and allowed for a time in which we can fully participate in the mysteries of God and not merely be bystanders and actually encounter Jesus. The second great gift that Francis accomplished was his belief that Francis himself was not a priest. Francis himself was not a bishop or a pope. Francis simply employed his relationship with Jesus through the living relationship of those around him, and many were inspired by his example. This belief, first and foremost, that we can follow in the footsteps of Jesus 
that we can follow in the footsteps of radical commitment to Lady Poverty. And Lady Poverty, for us, doesn't necessarily mean a rejection of earthly goods. Far be it, God created the heavens and the earth, all things visible and invisible, to be good, but instead an excessive attachment to them. So instead to be attached to Christ first and foremost, as our Lord commands in sacred scripture. And ultimately, thirdly, Francis teaches us a way of approaching suffering. It's interesting that St. Francis of Assisi is the first person in recorded history that I'm aware of to receive the stigmata, the wounds of Christ. The stigmata of St. Francis would establish uh, a true linking between his identity and the identity of Jesus. As he bore in his hands and feet inside the wounds of the Passion. Now, most of us, this side of heaven, are not going to have literal stigmata. If you do, please email me. I would love to talk to you. But almost all of us are carrying crosses. Most of us are carrying wounds. Most of us are carrying sicknesses. Most of us are carrying our war with sin. Most of us are carrying our war with rejection or loneliness or pain. We have two choices. We could either help carry these wounds in us and in our neighbor, our neighbor who may be a spiritual or political or social leper. Or we could end up becoming selfish, petty, greedy and lock everyone out and live in isolationism. and live in a world where money and the pursuit of power and the pursuit of a theological preference that leaves us in a place of pride cuts us off from community and from an encounter with Christ. The great revelation of Jesus. The great unveiling of Jesus in the apocalypse. Is that of the arrival of the new Jerusalem and new heavens and a new earth. In which he says at the end, Behold, I make all things new. In the movie The Passion of the Christ, these words are transported to the Via Dolorosa, the way of the cross, in which Jesus, carrying the cross, turns to his mother and says, See, mother, I make all things new. I think Mel Gibson is a great poet in that scene. Regardless of your opinion of him, that is an eloquent depiction of what it means to carry your stigmata, your wounds, your cross for the salvation of souls in union with the once for all sacrifice of Christ. The newness of life and life more abundantly, the newness of the new Jerusalem that is to come, the newness of the revelation of Jesus Christ is made potently present when our neighbor and our friends and our families and yes, our enemies, particularly our enemies, see us carrying our cross with serene confidence in the will of God. Francesco reached to the leper and to the poor, and became himself physically poor, and spiritually in kinship with the lepers, so that we might all possess eternal riches with Christ. 
We live in a politically, socially, and spiritually divided world where many of the problems that Francesco faced are still with us. We might, we might not be facing Assisi in Perugia, but we might be facing wars between Democrats and Republicans in the United States, between radical traditionalists, progressive modernists, conservative Novus Ordos, Tridentine mass attendance, different rights of the church at times with their own series of points of view. And in all of this, I believe what Francesca would point us to and what I believe we must focus on is our commitment to Jesus first. Christ first. If I might be so bold, it is in the Gospel of Luke that the Good Samaritan is assisted not by a Levite, member of the priestly class, not by a fellow Israelite who is bound by the law to show compassion on his neighbor, but instead on a good Samaritan, on a neighbor of his who is considered politically and spiritually to be an enemy. And he gets off his donkey, places this beaten Israelite on that donkey, leads him to a tavern, and gives the money needed for his healing, pouring oil and wine on his wounds. And Jesus commands, go and do likewise. Charity is the fulfillment of the law. And while on this channel and in other places, I will defend orthodoxy doctrinally. If we do not possess charity, we do not truly walk with Christ. Francis of Assisi reached out with true fidelity to the fullness of the law, but also with true indwelling of the Holy Spirit and grace and faith in him who redeems us from our inability to observe the law. And it is our duty, if we are truly radical Christians, to be radical ambassadors of that charity, of that love. And we all fail at that. And that is why I believe today of all days is an encouragement to the memory and living intercession of Francis of Assisi. To be reminded that though the world is dark, just as it took simply the radical commitment of this one apostle, this one servant, this one disciple of Jesus, to revive the woundedness in the church. All it takes is one listener right now to hear the word of God, to hear Jesus say to your heart, rebuild my church, listen and follow for our communities, our parishes, our homes, to become once more beacons of grace and witness to the resurrection power of Christ. I encourage each and every one of you to spend time today in prayer as to how, with your unique talents and gifts, you can help rebuild the wounded and broken walls of this house and to invite the presence of Jesus who heals all wounds and raises us from the dust to invite his presence into our lives so that we can be better disciples of his glory. I look forward to hearing from you in the comment section, and I hope you have a blessed day.